Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind that both employees and customers love and support. In this episode, I had a great pleasure talking with Mark Horton, who is the former CEO of the Australian-based Mexican chain Guzmani & Gomez. He has also held a number of executive positions in one of the most successful brands in the world, McDonald's. MD of the UK, VP of Pacific, Middle East and Africa, and MD of New Zealand, and a number of other key roles in his 20-year-long career inside McDonald's. Mark has a strong track record of some amazing results, such as doubling the estate of Guzmani and Gomez. I have also been lucky to work with Mark in the UK, so I'm also excited to share both Mark's story and insights, as well as his approach to leadership, which is truly maverick having experienced it myself firsthand. Mark takes us on his journey through his career and how he sees the impact of the pandemic from the sidelines. Mark believes the industry already pre-pandemic was very close to a massive transformation and the pandemic have just accelerated this. He especially talked about how the delivery trend has been a very big part of driving this disruption. Mark shares also some learnings he got while driving Uber and how he enjoyed talking with people as well, helping out a young entrepreneur he was driving to the airport around Christmas time. We talk about how the future looks for the industry and how founders, CEOs and MDs should be navigating in these times to come. We also dive in specifically to what kind of leadership there is needed to succeed in the new paradigm. Mark gives some stellar and clear advice on how to do this. This is a unique opportunity to tune into a conversation with somebody that has worked the most successful restaurant brands globally. So grab your headphones, coffee and notebook and shut the world out for the next 60 minutes because you are in for an amazing ride when it comes to strategic and human leadership. Enjoy. In the middle of the pandemic, or are we in the beginning? Nobody really knows. But I have hooked up with a, a former colleague of mine who is uh, Mark Horton. That is also the former CEO for uh, Guzman and Gomez, and also have spent a lifetime in uh, McDonald's as CEO in different parts of, of the world. And I'm sure that Mark really will give you something to think about because he have build businesses across the world with a specific way to to how to lead these businesses into success. So welcome to the the podcast Mark. Pleasure to talk to you again. As we just said before we went live, I've been I've been uh, I've been reaching out to you a couple of times because uh, we met we worked together in uh, in McDonald's in the UK uh, uh, and I thought the way you were thinking leadership was actually the way forward in general for the industry at that point. And I've been quite persistent to to get you on because I know you you will have an interesting uh, interesting views and thinking that will actually help maybe people navigating out of all this uncertainty we see right now with the pandemic. So thank you very much for, for getting on, Mark. Pleasure. It is an interesting time. Talk about interesting time before we go into that. It will be great just for people out there that doesn't know who Mark Horton is and uh, what what your journey has been within uh, hospitality uh, and life and and uh, and where you are now. Yeah, sure. Well, I guess the starting point is I was I was born to a Huddersfield man up in uh, the lovely northern parts of uh, England in uh, Yorkshire, um, but I did uh, grow up in uh, Australia and mostly for that part grew up in a little town called Coffs Harbour, which is halfway between Sydney and Brisbane, 50,000 uh, people, and I joined McDonald's there on my 15th birthday, which was uh, the start of my uh, big career there. But uh, you know, over that uh, time, I, I did an accounting degree while I was at McDonald's. I became a manager at McDonald's. Um, I uh, worked for Ernst & Young. I moved to Sydney. Uh, and uh, then eventually, McDonald's head office in Sydney gave me a call to say, how about you come and work for our finance team? Uh, we're looking for chartered accountants who uh, have worked in McDonald's stores. So I did that many years ago. And um, that started... Um, uh, my very long-term McDonald's career, which included being in finance, being in supply chain. I opened the, the Boston market chain in Australia. 
And uh, then I became the CEO of McDonald's in New Zealand. I moved to Singapore and looked after McDonald's in Middle East Africa, which was 23 markets uh, for a very interesting region for a poor little Coffs Harbour boys. I've got plenty of stories if we had lots of time about what I saw in uh, uh, in the uh, in the uh, Middle East, um, and then I became the uh, the managing director of McDonald's in the United Kingdom, uh, which, as you know, is a very large six billion dollar brand in the uh, UK. So that was great, but uh, it was time to come home for a variety of different reasons. And uh, I came home thinking I'm never going to do food again because you know McDonald's is the biggest and best best as far as you know results and penetration in the marketplace. Uh, and I was looking at a couple of opportunities to, uh, to look into non-food areas. But I came home and saw this Guzmani Gomez, which uh, is a brand that started in 2006. And by that time, I'd already left to New Zealand. Uh, but a couple of ex-McDonald's Australian legends had bought into it. And one of them was Steve German, who was a very long-term CFO of McDonald's Australia and was a really mentoring father-type figure to me. So I was very close with him. And he asked me to have a look at the brand and possibly look at working with them. And I was still very determined not to uh, stay in food, but I saw the brand and, and saw some fabulous high quality food served as fast as McDonald's. And I, I hadn't seen that before, that combination before of really good quality food. I mean, talking grilled chicken actually cooked on a grill on site and hadn't seen that before served that fast. And I thought, geez, there's something really in this, but I, but I, but I didn't want to do food again. And I, and I also didn't want to say no to my long-term mentor, Steve German. So I agreed to meet the founder, a bloke called Stephen Marks. And him and uh, Robert Hazen were two long-life mates from New York who moved to Australia with um, both married Australian women. And uh, I said, okay, I'll go and meet them. But knowing that I actually didn't want to make a good impression because I actually thought, how about I'll get the founder to not like me and he can say no to my long-term uh, mentor. So I said, okay. <laughs> I'm okay as long as he comes all the way out to the northern beaches of Sydney, which is where I was living, which was a long way from where the office was. Um, and he agreed to do that. And then I thought, I'm going to dress up looking like a complete slob. I don't know if that's a term used in Europe, like looking very untidy. So I turned up in, in, uh, in, in board shorts and flip-flops. I was unshaved. And I thought, there's no way he's going to want a CEO looking like this. Now, as it turns out, uh, he actually was very worried that as the next CEO of uh, McDonald's UK, that I was actually going to be a little bit uh, pompous, a little bit uh, too good for the, the brand. So he was actually genuinely excited when he saw me <laughs> turn up uh, the way I, uh, I actually did. And then I listened to him for an hour. And for those that know or have ever met Stephen Marks, he's one of the most inspiring, energetic leaders and founders uh, that I've ever come across. And after an hour talking to him, uh, I just really wanted to be a part of what he was building and on the basis that the actual brand and, and, um, and, and product offering was just so uh, exceptional. So I started five lovely years there and we did some fabulous things with the brand and it's going exceptionally well uh, before COVID and I would say even better in life after COVID for a variety of different reasons, which is what we'll no doubt cover. And the interesting thing, Mark, was I've, I've been reading up a bit. It was like you've been on a journey with them where you almost have doubled the business and taking it uh, abroad as well, uh, outside Australia to US, Japan, Singapore. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, we, we had a great time. I mean, firstly, Steve and Robert and I uh, sat down and the first question, obviously, for the founders was, you know, what is your long-term uh, mission here uh, with this brand? And their response was they wanted to be the biggest restaurant company in the world. And, you know, founders obviously have very aspirational goals. So I said, well, well, the first thing is um, you, you will need to be in the QSR. You need to be in fast food because that's the biggest. If you want to be the biggest, that's the sector you're going to have to be in. And if you don't want to move the brand into fast food, then you have to choose another uh, another goal because GYG was pretty much, say, for the sake of the argument, like the five guys, um, it was more of a fast, casual uh, shop front uh, type, type offering. And so, and, and power to uh, Robert and Stephen, they, they both agreed that that was the, uh, the way to go, despite the risk of a stigma going to fast food meant there was a sense that your food was bad. But GYG had already, GYG is short for Guzmani Gomez, GYG had already brought up a very strong brand following um, for a lot of uh, very core customers, although the percentage of people that were aware of the brand was still quite low in those times. We had 
58 restaurants when I started in 2015. Um, so we went through a very long journey of moving the brand from fast casual into QSR. And, and that, that's, that's a lot bigger than people think. And there's a lot of brands that see a lot of success in drive-through and just think, well, we're going to do drive-through. But a lot of brands, um, they're not really positioned to go in a drive-through. And, and, a, and a key requirement for drive-through is the ability to do very high volume uh, because you need that for the, uh, for, to make the economics work. But more importantly, if you had a drive-through lane on, I mean, drive-through sales, as you know, in McDonald's is 60-something percent. In GYG, it's about 50 percent. Um, so you're putting on so much extra volume. Um, at the same time, you've got lots of new delivery volume coming in, which is a subject we'll talk about soon. Um, so many brands have this desire to be in fast food, but actually haven't got the operating platform uh, to actually put enough throughput through to be able to actually do drive through work in a way that the customer experience is good and to make the, uh, the economics work. Um, luckily for me, GYG, again, had that really high quality, clean food and had the operating platform that was fast as McDonald's. So it really put GYG into that space to be able to go on to fast food. But that actually meant that we had to start a new real estate strategy. We had to look at the menu offering we had because portability was important. So over the years, we... Uh, We've added fries, we've added mini portions, uh, we've added a cheaper product range over time. I still say we because we're a shareholder. I should say I'm no longer working at GYG. I've, I'm, after, after nearly five years, I handed the CEO ship back to the founder, uh, Stephen Marks, who was taking the brand on to even higher levels, which is, uh, which is fantastic. But all of the technology systems uh, needed, uh, needed changing. So, so there was so much that had to be done uh, to make that, work and i would have to say that it was one of the the best things that we did um, because in life after covid which we'll talk about soon um, restaurants had a real strong suburban footprint restaurants that had a high delivery platform and a high drive-through platform uh, are just doing exceptionally well and and uh and setting records um, and in that time uh 58 restaurants i think in australia we had about 125 uh, by the time I left, of, of that, about 30 were drive-throughs. Um, we, uh, GYG is in Singapore. They were already in Singapore when I started. They are in Japan. They were in Japan when I started, but they've obviously added more restaurants. Um, and then we opened in the US in January uh, this, this year, and I was lucky enough to go over to the opening in Napierville, Napierville in Chicago. Important that Napierville is a large suburban centre. It's not in the downtown part. Of Chicago. So a lot of people asked us, why are you going to the US? There is a mazillion, gazillion Mexican um, restaurants there and Chipotle is already there that has this major scale. But one thing you noticed about the, uh, the US business, and this comes back to a point I'll constantly make, you've really got to be very clear with what your competitive advantage is as a business. And for GYG, it was this quality food, which I believe, which I don't believe, I know it was better quality than Chipotle. And we serve it as fast as McDonald's and have a drive through Now, in the US, there actually aren't any brands that we came across or any customer could tell us about that had this sort of quality food that was a bit above Chipotle, um, but actually had a drive through as well. And what we know is that people in America love Mexican and they love drive throughs So we felt, we felt there was a really strong niche there that was taking two loves in the US that... Um, uh, that would see us really do well. And we opened extremely well there. And then this funny thing called COVID uh, came yeah. along. So <laughs> it's uh, put growth plans on pause there, but I've got no doubt over the long term that it's going to be extremely successful in the, uh, in the US. You already tossed a couple of things that you said we're going to dive into. But what I think that's interesting with you as well, uh, that you, you took the break from the, the CEO uh, role, but also you've been you've been doing bucket list things. You've been doing things you need to do in life to really live. You've been on some travels. You've been sharing that on LinkedIn. But also one of the things I, I saw when I reached out to you again was that you've been uh, out being an Uber driver for a couple of weeks. That's... To con connect with the the real world, uh, you said, and I think th I think that's a great thing. What did you learn from that? Because that must have been such a you know, a, in a way, a relief, a, a simple thing to do: drive people around, have a chat with them. 
It was. I had a fabulous bucket list. I mean, I went to the US opening. I went to Columbia. I did courses, took kids on a cruise, took my mum on a holiday, joined a gym, all the things you do. But I drove Uber for two weeks and obviously everybody laughed at me at the start going, you know, geez, what's wrong with you? But I always sat and looked at the Uber driver and thought, mate, you're just sitting there having conversations with people all day. And, and I just thought to myself, after 14 years of being a CEO, wouldn't it be great just to have chats with no pressure, no data coming at you from everywhere? And I genuinely loved it. I did it for two weeks. That was my uh, bucket list. I've got a 4.98 rating, I should say. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty good. In Uber that's Driver quite good, world. yeah. Um, and I got to the end of it and I found I, I missed it. I really missed the social interaction with, uh, with people. And it really struck me how conversational and social people were willing to be in the uh, car. So I actually still do it most Friday nights because... Everyone's finished work for the week. They're out having drinks and dinner. They're in a pretty jovial mood and it's just fun. But I actually, it struck me as we were going through COVID, how personal people are willing to be in the Uber car environment, what they're willing to share with a stranger. And I, I had a young guy who was probably in his early 20s who uh, had just bought two gyms in the northern beaches of Sydney. And he bought them like two weeks to a month before COVID began. And I picked him up from his gym and I was taking him to the airport because he was going home to see his parents. And he was in the car, he was trying to ring his accountant, his bankers, his landlords, his employees, all over the place. He was completely out of sorts. Um, and, he, and he told his best mate, he was ringing, just going, mate, I might as well just end it. And he was, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was in the car and I was going, geez, if I let this guy out of the car, he really could go and hurt himself. So I said to him, I said, mate, here's my background. What time's your flight? And he said, it's, it's three hours away. And so I said, mate, why don't we just pop over? What, what, let's just stop and have a coffee. And he said, oh, mate, that'd be great. So I sat down and had a coffee. We went through, mate, this is, this is what you need to do with your real estate, with your landlord, bang, bang, bang. This is what you need to do with your banks, bang, bang, bang. This is what you need. There's government support, do bang, bang, bang. And we went through all the key things he needed to do. And he walked away with a game plan. And then he, he got out of the car and you could see the energy back at his feet again. And, and, and that for me gave me the most pleasure when you talk to people who can really sort of get some benefit from you in that short period of time they're in the car with you. So um, I've, I've really enjoyed it and I keep doing it every Friday night. I get paid very poorly, by the way, so you should tip your river man whenever, if, if, <laughs> whenever, whenever you can. But it's not for the money. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fabulous social experience for me. I really enjoy it. Wow, it's, it's very interesting, yeah, because also people are very honest, I guess, in a, in the backseat of a, a taxi, in more than you actually would expect. They tell you things that they probably even don't tell you their nearest friends about their businesses and stuff, yeah. No, they don't. I could probably sit here for another hour, but I'm sure I've got other things to talk about, about my Uber story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's such an interesting thing that you went out on such a social experiment. And then uh, you already mentioned the pandemic hit, hit the industry and you already talked to the pound that there's some, some massive ships happening. So I know you're not uh, right now the, the captain on the ship right now, but you're still very closely connected to, uh, to the industry and what's going on. Uh, so what, what are you seeing and uh, what, what's happened right now and how do you think this is going to change the industry if you look 12, 18 months ahead? Well, yeah, it's a good question, Michael, and, and, I, and I think it's important to, to sort of go back a little bit further than COVID because I, I actually saw some major shifts happening in the market before COVID's come along. And, and I, I think all COVID's done is, is massively accelerate the movement. And so the things, the things that I, I talk about is, um, firstly, in the convenience space, I talk about a thing called reverse correlation when it comes to brands. And when you, when you look at people... Uh, and you ask them, you know, rank the brands that you're happy to tell people that you went to last week. Suffice to say, McDonald's and KFC are probably at the bottom. They're, they're brands that people normally aren't too proud to, uh, to tell people they've been to. Having said that, McDonald's and KFC over the last five years um, have delivered the strongest business growth over the last five years. So where you're seeing a lot of more trendy brands and food brands and pokey and all this sort of stuff, uh, sushi, you know, coming into the marketplace and they're the ones that people are proudly show people they're eating and tell people they're eating, take Insta photos over it. Um, but they're actually the ones that are really struggling. So it's just a reminder that convenience is absolute 
king. So again, when I met with Robert and Stephen, the founders, and we agreed to go into fast food, it was the massive first. Stephen always talked about the need to move your feet uh, constantly. And so the big move of the first feet was to shift the brand to leverage into that convenience movement. I mean, if brands that people don't like, uh, don't like telling people they've been to and don't trust, all the core elements that for most in the business world will go, well, that's a company that won't be succeeding, they still succeed showing the power of convenience. Um, and the next one was delivery. delivery. Delivery for the industry was the Kodak moment or the blockbuster moment of other, other industries. Like anything, uh, you know, brands that have been somewhat decimated by the online channel um, were decimated because they didn't get ahead of the curve and embrace this change in channel for whatever reason, whether they were concerned about quality, whether it was the margins and the commissions charged by the aggregators. Um, but delivery is the channel that is building, even before COVID, was building very aggressively in the, the background. And you probably heard, like many people, so many brands went, no, Uber Eats, I hate them. Deliveroo, I hate them. Their commissions are terrible. That's it. I'm not doing it. I want people to come into my restaurants. And any, and any restaurant brand that took that position early, I think, are the ones that are dead or in the process of dying uh, right now. And it's not uncommon. I mean, I remember I even had a debate back in 2014 when I was in the UK. Uh, one of my biggest um, friction points with my executive team was a strong desire I had to do in delivery in 2014, and they were unanimously opposed to it. And, and, and so if McDonald's were thinking that in 2014, I'm sure many others actually were. Now, obviously, it turned out that once the trend built, McDonald's got on board and, and no doubt driving a lot of their growth now. Um, we made a decision really early in Guzmani Gomez to, 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 to lead uh, delivery and be the number one customer with both delivery and Uber Eats who are the two key players um, in, uh, in Australia. Um, and that has really positioned Guzmani Gomez and any other brand that really embraced delivery nice and early have, have really set them up for success. So what you've seen through COVID now is delivery has just gone to a whole new level, particularly as people were staying at home, there was lockdowns, they weren't going to get out, they weren't, they weren't comfortable to go to restaurants because of the possible existence of COVID. So in many cases, um, delivery as a percentage of the mix uh, went up 50% to a near a double. So the problem you've got with that is there are a lot of uh, food places where the margins on delivery are very weak. If they didn't uh, leverage good commission rates with the aggregators or they didn't put the right pricing mechanisms in place, and even worse for franchising organisations, because then there was a big debate about the share of the pie and those delivery sales and what royalties, et cetera, the uh, franchisors should be charging the, uh, the franchisees. Um, but, what I, but what I find in the industry is I believe there's going to be a big movement from your individually operated restaurant or your mar and par restaurant, for want of a better word and um, a move more into the fast casual brands because delivery is going to continue to grow and grow and the individual independently owned restaurants um, cannot negotiate a good commission rate with the aggregators from what i understand the standard rate's about 35 percent mm, that's correct yeah and and for a lot of them they just can't make money out of it and unfortunately for them delivery is going to become a bigger and bigger part of the mix there's going to be a death by a thousand paper cuts um, in, uh, in that scenario for the individual restaurants. On the other hand, for the brands like McDonald's and KFC and Guzman and Gomez and other ones, um, you're able to negotiate a really good commission rate, um, one, because you can offer a lot of business, but importantly, you can offer a very big database opportunity uh, for, the, uh, for the aggregators. And, and, and more importantly, um, or just as importantly, uh, you can actually negotiate very strong brand presence on the um, on the apps of the aggregators. So when you go on to you open up your Deliveroo app, uh, more often than not, you'll see the big players first on there because they've negotiated that as part of the overall package with the integrator. So what you what you're seeing is you're seeing the big brands um, are getting an economic advantage. They're getting a marketing advantage. Um, things that the independent restaurants actually can't. Uh, achieve so I think you're going to see a a market share shift from the independents into the more branded restaurants 
uh, moving forward. And, and that's obviously good and bad for, for some and others in the, uh, in the marketplace. I mean, for me, CBDs have always been a, uh, a risk. I think there is, most governments around the world are trying to spread the CBD and the more, um, you know, more suburban areas. Um, in Sydney, that would be in Parramatta. By memory, in the UK, there's a whole city, as a Milton Keys or something, was it city up in the north that was, was built to try and release some of the stress um, on London. And the other one is shopping centres. Uh, shopping centres, for me, have always had structural risk. Um, and in food, particularly, what I was finding in shopping centres, and again, this is probably a bit Australian-centric, uh, is that what you were finding was that a lot of the fashion outlets were leaving shopping centres because the online retail and online clothing sector was so strong. And what shopping centres would do, would they put new food players in there because that was really all they could probably find. Um, so what you were finding was that for food players in shopping centres, you were getting less foot traffic coming in because the online piece was keeping people away and you were having to share what was left with a bigger number of players. Um, at the same time, the shopping centre is charging an extra 3 to 5% rent each year. So that whole model is, a, for me, a major structural problem and, and risk. And over the longer term, I still can't see anything that's done in shopping centres that is not under online pressure. Um, and that's the game. I mean, you even think about supermarkets. Um, all the supermarkets are building these massive, dark supermarkets that are solely for home delivery. I mean, at some point, the movie theatres, uh, the time between a movie being played at a theatre and the time it's available on pay-per-view on all the streaming channels is probably going to reduce uh, over time. So you think through what will you actually go to shopping centres for in the future that isn't so easily accessible and affordable by doing it at home? Because even on home delivery with the uh, supermarkets, um, they're actually setting up these massive low-cost uh, kitchens with low rent and low operating costs, and those savings are basically funding the cost of doing the delivery component because most people are now at home getting used to everything being delivered at not much extra cost to them. So, again, you bring all of that back to, you know, the world of fast, the industry of food. Um, that was all happening before COVID came along. What, what COVID has done has, has materially put the accelerator on delivery as a channel going faster, more people working from home in the suburbs, uh, drive throughs going uh, really well, less people in shopping centres, and more people realising they can get most things, people, most things delivered at home at, at very little cost. And so what, what COVID has done by really accelerating that is in the, in the food game, you've had a... Uh, many brands majorly succeed. Um, I think McDonald's and KFC and Guzmani Gomez are all doing very, very strong growth. I heard Stephen Marks on a QSR media function say all of the drive throughs in Guzmani Gomez are now doing 30% increases. Um, where you will see ones that are very downtown or city based and shopping centre based are doing minus 50s uh, and 60s. So you've really seen a parting of the seas. From a worse, and you've really now got what I call two classes uh, of food brands in the uh, in the food industry, um, and that and that and that means that every single brand, no matter whether they've done really well or really good, are now facing different issues and challenges that they need to uh, that they need to face moving forward. It's interesting because uh, I agree with you, Mark. This way before we went into the pandemic, the people that was in problem will just be even in more problems here because it's oh, they're already maybe not set up for for the future, and uh, that could be independent, but it could also be changed. And you you can already see here in the UK there's a number of CVAs going on, administration going on, especially in the uh, casual dining sector. There is, is, a, is more sit-in and in-dining than many anything else. And they're now trying to get on the delivery kind of thing, the, the click and collect, and it's very difficult for them to, to turn the ship around, but also because there's no cash around to do it. So you have to, to bootstrap in principle. I think if, you, if you're getting into delivery now, it'll be really challenging because one, I think the aggregators have done all their deals they can to the big players. So their ability to give brands, particularly smaller ones, a good commission deal is, is quite challenging. But, you know, I mean, I think this comes back to as leaders, you've got to really 
you know, put the customer first and embrace the, uh, the trends. And I, I think a lot of challenges for food, but delivery, you know, if you're on it and doing really well, well played and, and, and congratulations to you, you'll be one of the ones that survive. But there are risks with delivery. I mean, the margins normally aren't as good. Um, but more importantly, and, and, you know, Stephen and I used to talk about this in Guzmán de Gomez. I mean, how uh, the problem with more delivery is there's a bigger percentage of your customer base not, ser- not eating your food at its highest quality point. I mean, we all come from, you know, McDonald's days. I mean, French fries delivered versus eating them in the restaurant are two very different things. And if you're also a brand that has great decor or you've got great staff, you've got great culture, there is fundamentally an experience in the restaurant, which is part of your brand proposition. Well, obviously, again, the customers aren't seeing that, but they're still paying the same price um, for things that are cost embedded into the in-restaurant experience. So um, it, it, it is a real challenge. Uh, for restaurants that really want to preserve their quality and uh, and the experience in their restaurants. But it's still no excuse for not understanding the future trends of the business and the need to embrace them really early because it wasn't just delivery in the food sector. How many sectors have gone through online carnage, <laughs> whether it was uh, clothing or whether it was, uh, as I said, Blockbuster in the video space and Netflix and Kodak before, or with the digital cameras, there has been case after case um, of companies that have been slaughtered because they haven't embraced uh, how consumers are moving move, moving forward and um, they've tried to defend their current patch because that is the lower risk one in the short term in their eyes. What is the uh, biggest surprise you've seen in all this that's going on? What has have shocked you? Is there anything that has shocked you? Well, I think the thing that's... Uh, well, in the food sector, I think the thing that shocked me is how how the extreme of that movement in the past. I mean, I mean to see your know, McDonald's, KFCs, and GYG, it's just the massive growth uh, they've they've seen. And I mean, they all did negative comps when markets were in the worst of the lockdowns because no one could really even leave their home. Um, but once once some of the restrictions came in place and the government stimuluses came out, you saw some remarkable levels of Growth and in the other way, it was just interesting to see um, how negative um, you know others have gone. But um, outside of food, of course, as we all know, the very interesting thing that has really shocked a lot of people is is how how well the stock markets have done uh, in the background. I was reading today that McDonald's have hit an all time high um, in their uh, you know in their uh, in their share price. So it's um, uh, that's interesting as well because the share market does have some sort of link to confidence and desire for people to spend in the marketplace. So that'll be interesting to see how that plays out over time. If you should do your educated guess and you can't do anything else right now because uncertainty is so big, you almost sometimes can't see two weeks ahead as a leader of a business. But uh, how do you see the whole market uh, look in 12 to 18 months when we hopefully are starting to have a vaccine that is being uh, uh, implemented? Uh, the pandemic has uh, found its, its way uh, out of our communities and so on but how do you see the restaurant market at that point because 12 to 18 months is a long time in the restaurant market struggling with cash flow well i think long and short term michael i I actually still think the the trends we're seeing before covid and accelerated by covid i still think the guy actually continue in the background i think delivery will continue to grow as a percentage of the uh the mix i i think that uh drive-throughs will be continued to be uh, successful. I think there'll be a lot of independent restaurants that will close, that will move business into the uh, the chain restaurants. And again, I think Guzmán Gomez particularly is very well placed uh, for that. So I think all of that's going to happen. I, I think the uh, the interesting thing will be a little bit, bit of volatility still um, to to play out. And you know, one that always comes to mind is is government stimulus. Uh, so if some of the good results or any results are being driven by government stimulus, obviously at some point that will uh, reverse. So does that mean that for a period of time, some of these strong markets go into a little bit of negative before they continue their journey positive? And what does that mean for a, uh, a leadership position uh, is, uh, is really important. Um, and um, the other one, I guess, is the work from home mentality now. And that's partly why a lot of the suburban drive through type restaurants is I mean, any boss who had these had cynicism about employees being productive at home um, has been answered. Um, 
And some have been answered that they can't be trusted and they'll be dealt with. But for the most part, I think most people have shown that their productivity levels and even their mental health is stronger by working from home. I speak to a lot of people who go to the gym instead of the time they were in the bus or the train into work, they're now going to the gym. Um, they're able to go and pick their kids up from school and then get back on the laptop. So I think what it's proven, productivity and mental health is so strong. I think you'll still see a, some percentage of people who are working from home through COVID will now stay. But I do think some will go back. So suburban brands like your McDonald's, Guzmani Gomez and KFCs uh, might see a bit of an, a, a negative drag as you're seeing some of that come back to the city. And, and for what it's worth, a lot of those city-based brands who are doing minus 50 obviously really need that for them to, uh, uh, to succeed moving forward. So I think that long term, I think it's going to continue, but leaders are going to have to still manage some, uh, some volatility. Uh, in the in the uh, next twelve months, as we get to some sort of sense of normal again. Yeah, and uh, and then you know uh, Pratt from your your time in in the UK, and they are really struggling, and a really strong brand, I would say, and it has many of the elements you talked about. You know, purpose, culture, experience, multi revenue, and uh, also on the on the tech why, but they didn't move probably fast enough to to be ready for this, and uh, and probably not out of a a bad situation it was just it was just so much going on they had so many try you know so busy on a day to day with the office environment especially london and bigger cities again and you can see that how they suddenly is i think there's many people looking at that thinking wow that's that's a bit of a shock that a, a such a, a well established brand is just losing momentum now and and they talking about maybe you know maybe they're going to go to half the size it's 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 it's, it's crazy yeah but as you, as you said what we said before they've they've got lots of uh, um, a lot of their outlets are reliant on, on workers, uh, city workers. They're a very lunchtime dominated uh, brand. Uh, delivery, they've got no drive-throughs. Um, and they are a yeah, socially responsible brand that everybody loves. But again, I keep coming back to, I think, I think we have roles as leaders to be socially responsible. Um, but at the same time, you, you do acknowledge that the, 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 the business is growing the strongest, uh, McDonald's and KFC. Um, and so the challenge is how do you get the right balance of being socially responsible but coming back to what customers actually want is good quality, good quality food, easily accessible. That's, that's the key. Now, if you can become a much-loved brand on top of that, of course that really helps. Um, but, you know, I, I, I've now got to the point where I actually don't believe in customer research. Any, any more. Um, and, and to be fair, it was Stephen at GYG that, uh, you know, uh, uh, convinced me of this, is that people, people don't tell the truth in research. What, what customers say they will do versus what they do to, uh, what they do to, I think the gap has, not, has never been as wide. Um, you know, before you talk about food, obviously you saw it in, you know, Trump's election in 16, Brexit. In Australia, the um, Scott Morrison was a long way behind in the polls. All the poll results are wrong. Um, whenever when, I remember, I remember when I launched Free Range Eggs in New Zealand, all the customers said that it, it, you know there was a thirty percent they will come in thirty percent more often if they if we use Free Range Eggs. The actual behaviour was not none was was none, um, but um, it was a strong building block in the brand. I mean, um, at Guzmani Gomez, uh, we launched Free Range Chicken uh, a few years ago. And um, I remember the conversation with, uh, with Steve and I said, oh, geez, that's, it's 1% impact on cost of goods and you now let's make sure we get a return on it. And you now Stephen is very strong on, on brand and a, and a very socially responsible guy. And, um, and his view was, mate, the only test we need to do is to put it in and see how it goes. And it probably won't spike overnight because, because again, if you want to research the customers, they would have said, if you, range, if you use free range chicken, we'll come in droves. That's what the research would have told you. But the reality is they don't because they sit there and go, no, it comes back to quality product. How is the accessible? Is it? Can I afford it? And that always supersedes anything else you do. But the good thing for Guzmani Gomez was that, um, yes, the free chicken didn't spike short-term sales, but definitely it was a critical building block um, to building the love for the brand over time. And as long as you're doing a number of other things uh, at the same time to build a brand and you just start doing that one little thing in isolation, then as long as it's part of building a very strong brand wall and over time you will get a return on that, but it won't be, uh, it won't be immediate. Um, but, but I don't believe research. I'm now a very big fan. If you want to do something, throw it in for a quick test, 
fail fast and uh, and get it out because the key for leaders now is how do you access actual customer behaviour versus making decisions on what they tell you they will probably do. Um, and that's now a big one for me. It's very interesting because that's a bit also uh, how tech companies find out how they uh, hook pro people in their products. Are they actually doing the behavior they thought they would? They can only do that by throwing it out there and test it in a way. So, And I think that and that's thereby you would actually quicker know if you have something that will work or not for the business, both uh, from a brand point of view, but also from a financial point of view. So it's a very interesting approach. Uh, Mark, uh, in this crazy uncertainty and the layer of uh, there's layers of uncertainty and there's more than one thing going on what kind of a uh, leadership is needed here and now it's a good question uh, i think it's i mean so far, so for so many years leadership were for the most part about incrementally improving their brand and results um but i can't think of i can't think of a brand or business whether it's food or not that is the same as it was pre-covid as what it is Uh, post COVID, um, so uh, my, my my first view is that someone needs to get up to that high helicopter level uh, and really think about where the business strategically needs to be uh, moving forward. So when when COVID started, I mean I had quite a few people ringing me for advice, and of course when COVID started, most people set up a a war room or whatever people call it, like a a room to manage uh, all the issues with uh, with COVID. Um, and I call that a defensive room uh, where you've got all the key stakeholders around. Obviously, you're working out what's happening to sales, what's happening to our people, health and safety, what's government uh, support and, and rules around um, how the economy and how restaurant operations are going to be impacted. And that's a very important thing. But I always said to, said to anyone that asked is that at the same time, I think you need a, a second war room. Um, and let's call up the attack It's a bit like the uh, American football, isn't it? You've got your defensive team and your attack team. Because I think any, any, any business or brand that worked out pretty early that there was a massive opportunity to win from the new playing field, um, that needed a complete, in my mind, separate war room that was the attack one because the whole mindset was different. It was about, it was about attack and being positive and winning where the defensive team was all about protecting and making sure everybody was, uh, was okay. So... You know, obviously, um, uh, for, for the attack team, for, for, for businesses that have been negatively impacted, it was about, well, one, how are we going to make sure that we survive? And then that's what the defensive team was for. But the attack team was going to be, how do we actually now reposition ourselves? Or pivot is pivot the new fancy world that fancy people use these days, Michael. Pivot. <laughs> I think I think I, I always prefer the uh, repositioning or positioning because because it's not it's never changed in the in the book it's of right. uh, marketing. Oh, yeah. So 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 they need to be thinking. So in food, they're going okay. Are we as good as we can on delivery? Do we have the operating platform to uh, to go into draw throughs? Uh, how do we negotiate leases moving forward? Is our real estate plan moving forward the right thing? Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then you get to the attack of the ones that are doing really well. And, and I, I always use this term positive dissatisfaction because if I'm doing a 30% increase, yes, I'm very positive. You've got to celebrate, pat everyone on the back. But, but for me, particularly in food, there's not many food brands that can just put 30% on their sales and be ready to deliver an exceptional customer experience. So I look at that and go, geez, did they have enough people? Uh, what was the customer experience like? What were the service times like? What's the capacity now? What are those drive-through lanes like? And so basically it becomes a, um, uh, we're not creating demand anymore. It becomes, geez, how do we now work out how to meet all of this extra uh, demand moving forward? Do we need, you now McDonald's went through doing extra two drive-through lanes. Do we need more seats? Do we need to be pushing the digital channel more to, to alleviate some of that um, delivery-wise? You know, there was, in McDonald's and some Guzmani Gomez stores, there was sometimes 20 delivery riders sitting in the dining room, clamoring over the customers trying to eat their food. So, so I look at that and go, right, now that we're in this significantly strong position, how do we now take this greatness and actually now accelerate that growth moving forward? My guess is that if, according to Steve's numbers, if, if GYG drive-throughs are doing 30%, my guess is if they had enough capacity, they could have been doing a lot more, maybe 40 or 50 um, cent. And then for a lot of, other brands um, and maybe outside of food, um, I think there is a little bit of, depends how nasty you want to be, but my guess is there's probably lots of other uh, brands out there that are on their knees 
Um, and possibly with a somewhat brutal approach, you could possibly give them their last rights with some certain, with some certain um, uh, decisions you make as a, uh, as a business to steal market share. So, so again, I, I, so from a leadership perspective, I think there's get up the helicopter level, look at your defence strategy and look at your attack um, strategy. One thing that the ones that are doing really well out of COVID is really deal with the, the risk of complacency uh in the in the business um don't believe that the customer experience uh is great don't believe that in 12 months time when government stimulus goes and people move into the city um that there's not going to be a negative pressure uh on the uh on the business kfc in australia was a really good example of this uh michael i live in the northern beaches of sydney around the manly area for those that have been to uh australia um and the way that the rules are working in Australia through COVID at the moment, because COVID has been very well managed in Australia, one of the highest performing in relation to COVID rates. Melbourne's been an issue, but outside of Melbourne, it's been great. All the dining rooms are open um, in all the restaurants in the northern beaches, including McDonald's and Guzmani Gomez, et cetera. But all the KFCs uh, in the northern beaches still have dining rooms that are closed. And now when you think through the mentality there, you've got franchisees going, I'm doing massive sales growth. If I open the kitchen up, I've now got to put labour on to clean. There's a cost of keeping the dining room operating. I'm doing 20% sales increase. Why would I? Um, but fundamentally, now either, so either the KFC leadership haven't been strong enough to force franchisees to protect the customer experience, um, or they don't believe it themselves that it's needed because they as a leadership team are seeing 20% sales increases them, uh, themselves. But I can tell you one thing for sure, Customers are angry that they can't come in and eat their food. So, you know, whilst you're doing 20%, their complacency is creating um, customer aggravation. And to think that at some point that won't bite you on the backside, um, for me, is naive. So, so leaders really have to, if they're doing well, manage uh, complacency. Um, and the other one is, I guess my last point on, on leadership is uh, empathy for your people. And uh, even, even, even brands that are doing really well, I mean, there's lots of people that don't know if they're going to have a job moving forward. There's still some volatility to come. Maybe their job's okay, but their, 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 their partner's job or their parent's job, uh, lending's become an issue. I mean, there's just so much out there that people are still very fragile uh, out there. So, so leaders are going to have to be uh, calm and strong in driving the business, but having a real arm around the shoulder uh, mentality in embracing the entire um, organisation. So I think that's something that, uh, and I'll call it a top and tail approach with leaders. I think leaders are going to have to be very good at the high end and setting strategy and calm and strong leadership. I think they have to have a very good executive team to run the middle part of the business, just making sure that everything's executed well and the data out of the business is gone. And then leaders need to get out in the field um, and really be very visible in that empathy and and the good thing for me when i used to be a ceo that was my favorite part of the uh the job and i still have some fabulous photos of my time in the uk i remember going to a uh, restaurant at colchester um and i, I remember going to uh the uh, the restaurant there it was in the top 10 highest volume uk restaurants it was only like an hour's drive uh, could be more outside of london and the the franchisee met me in the car park and he pulled me aside and said, oh, Mark, before you go in, I just need to tell you the crew are all quite, um, they're sort of jumping off the walls. Right? I said, okay, well, that's, that's nice. And I said, you need to know this restaurant's been here 25 years and the CEO's never been. I said, oh, that's a bit, that's a bit odd. I went into the restaurant and, uh, and the you know, they were all pretty excited and that excited me, et cetera. And I remember talking to the restaurant manager about, um, now, what's your record drive, record carved through drive through in an hour? And they said, oh, I think we're about 140. Um, I could be making up numbers here, but it's the example. I said, what's it going to take to get you to 180? And then she sat down and went, oh, these four or five things and blah, blah, blah. And we had a good laugh about it. We got all the rest of the management team around the table. And then I thought, let's do something funny here. I said, let's go and get a bucket of ketchup. We got a uh, prep pan liner out and we all wrote down, we are going to achieve 180 cars by the, the end of three months. And all of the management team and the crew put their hands in the ketchup and we all put ketchup handprints um, mm. on, that, uh, on, that, uh, <laughs> on, that, on that bit of 
um, paper, as it turned out, much to the horror of my executive team once I got back. But um, but um, but but that's but that's what you, that, that's where leaders are going to have to be. You, you, that you just really make them feel that they um, you care about them, they're part of the brand, and you're thinking about them moving forward. In, in um, fair play to Stephen Marks in, uh, again in Guzmani Gomez when um, again I was gone by the time COVID was, but from what I understood. Um, when a lot of restaurants, I mean, even Guzmani Gomez, the restaurants in the CBD obviously got majorly impacted, like every brand that had uh, restaurants in the in the CBD area. And most, the normal approach for most people would have been, are those stores making money? If not, close them. And then what happens to the people? A little bit of, well, I sort of care, but I don't. And that's quite interesting because how many brands say people are first and people are they hard about, you know, blah, 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 from... From what I understand, what Stephen Marks did, uh, because because money Gomez in Australia is predominantly Latin. Most of the most sixty percent of the workforce are uh, Colombian, so it's a very strong Latin workforce, which is great because their culture and energy is fantastic. But it makes the brand very authentic because it's a Mexican food being served by Latin uh, people. Now a lot of those Latins are on student visas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if if Stephen had have closed the restaurants uh, and shut them down a lot of the Latin workforce would have had no choice but to go home. Um, and that, that would have eventually ruined their lifetime dream of uh, having a long-term life in Australia. So what Stephen did, as I understand, uh, was that he worked out how many Latins he had, how many Latins needed to have a job, and then worked backwards to work out how many restaurants were needed to stay open to make sure that all of those people were looked after and could continue uh, a job and a life uh, in Australia. And, um, and when... Now, you, you know what values are like. Values are only real if they end up costing you something. Um, so at that moment, Stephen put a badge of honour on Guzmani Gomez saying, um, we actually do put people first. We say it and we follow through on it. And I'll tell you, all of those workers in the GYG restaurants will be forever indebted uh, to him. And that is what drives culture. It's, it's the arm around the shoulder uh, for those people who will always give back to that business moving uh, forward. It's so interesting a uh, story about uh, Stephen there because again what he did there was taking care of the communities and the people before he took care of his own own business and, uh, and and thereby the community probably helped him and the people to take care of his business. He didn't even have maybe to do a lot of things. There was like there must have been a, such an engagement. Uh, but the interesting thing you said there, Mark, what I got, but what, what I was also my big believer on as a leader, you need to set the strategic direction, the positioning of the business. You need to set the team, the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus. And as talking about that, a muscle to be a massive opportunity to bring in talent to your business now if you are in a growing position because people are leaving their jobs left, right, and center. Uh, and then, of course, go out and build that culture with, with empathy, so people know that you are you are for real, you are authentic person. The, they don't only see on on a, a video calls, or a, you need to be out there in the front line to build the business. So yeah, that's what people you know. What I mean, one thing that I've I've learned from my days in McDonald's, which I do completely different uh, if I was still there, is the role of marketing. Um, you know, in the in the business, I think people are getting quite over commercials that are some fictional make-believe uh, scenario. What they want is, is realness, you know, in the brand. And, and brands that have a core product and culture where the marketing just becomes amplifying what you do are the ones that are going to really succeed, uh, you know, moving forward. I mean, when, when GYG uh, opens a new restaurant, they do what's called a free burrito day. Um, they basically give a free burrito to anybody that comes in on that first day. The, the logic is that everyone gets to try how good the food is. They see how fast it's served. They see the energy and culture uh, of the people. And, and quite often the people feel that once they get that free one, they sort of feel a sense of giving back to the brand um, as a thank you moving forward. Now, a cost of a free burrito day, give or takes thirty to 50000 for that brand, and that's quite expensive. But then when you go into social media and tell everybody that there's a, uh, a free burrito coming up, the amount of reach you get as everyone tags each other and through social media, um, you, you get more penetration than you would get by a radio or TV ad. So what you're seeing in the, in the world of marketing is stop spending half a million dollars on making a make-believe fictional ad that people may or may not see because on TV they only fast-forward the ads anyway. 
Um, how can you bring your marketing back to being real and amplifying uh, what you do? So instead of spending $50,000 on a radio advertisement or on brochures or banners or things like that to tell everybody a new store is open, move it into the cost of the product yourself and get free media on the back of, um, you know, on the back of doing it. So, you know, I think when you get to that situation and all of a sudden people love your brand and they're telling other people about it, you know, the workers at GYG tell everybody how good GYG was in the way they managed them through COVID. It's just another, it's, it's another brick in the brand wall that's constantly building growth over time. You know, it's important when, when, when I started at GYG, the, the, the demographic that came to GYG was mostly 18 to 35 year olds. Um, and what one of the possibly unintended benefits at the time was if you want to be one of the biggest restaurant companies in the world, you've got to appeal to as much of the masses as you actually can. And 18 to 35 wasn't going to cut it. So. Um, one of the unintended benefits is we did fries and smaller, cheaper portions and value components was um, I, I go past GYGs these days and see high school kids. Uh, I have an eight and 10 year old daughter. Their favorite food is now a GYG um, is that, you know, what you do. And, you know, I guess part of one of my leadership things to think about is whatever your demographic is at the moment, how do you appeal to a bigger part of the masses as you uh, as you move forward? And I think that's been a big part of GYG's success. Uh, as well. Mark, you have a extremely uh, strong experience and, and tried a lot of stuff and been in a lot of uncertainty before, but, but how would you, how are you right now? And how would you say that as a, a leader, CEO, MD, founder of a, a restaurant business, how do you should continue grow and learn? Because I guess that's one of the key things to, to, to stay on top of things and get out of this. Well, yeah, well, well I'll tell you personally, I'm, I'm doing great because I've, um, uh, I haven't. Uh, I've been on the sideline through COVID, and I think I've been probably mentally quite lucky for that. But I've also been blessed to study the market. I've had lots of people reach out for help, um, so um, I've really enjoyed uh, doing that as well. But you know, I do think leaders need to. I mean, I think the first thing is 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 be prepared to put your hand up and, and ask for help. Um, you know, a lot of these companies have boards. Uh, I had a CEO coach for my entire time. Uh, in uh, you know in McDonald's and and just feel free to put your hand up to people you can trust to see where you can help and whether that's getting some external help in because sitting, me sitting here saying that you can change your business because every business has changed you got to work out how to how to run with it it's easier said than done of course so so I really do think be prepared to ask for help um, put your arm around the shoulders of your entire organisation whatever you're going to do making sure there's a bit of co-contribution to it and making sure everybody's aligned uh, on board uh, is really important. But I, but I think the exciting thing is, is um, particularly for the brands that I've been involved with that I actually believe are actually longer term benefiting from COVID is, is you know, short term pain for long term gain. And I actually think um, once things start to settle, I think it's going to be an exciting opportunity for those that take up the opportunity to work out what to do differently um, in leveraging the new world uh, that we're, we're in today. You've got to keep moving your feet. In the end of the, the podcast, Mark, because we, we're starting to get there, is uh, I always ask the guests to give like tea, three top advice to leaders out there. What, what, what would you do right now? We can also we can rephrase the question. What would Mark do if he was sitting in a CEO role in a food business right now? What would be your top three advice? Well, I'll probably summarising what I've said, Michael, but again, I think the first thing is really think through, get, get, get to the top and really think through your defence and attack uh, strategies. This is a moment in time to reposition um, and gain from the new world. And as long as you can do it faster than better than others, uh, you will get through this at the, uh, at, at the other end. I think that's absolutely the first uh, and important part. Uh, I think secondly is to really think about your army of people. Um, this is an opportunity to uh, build um, an army of love for your brand and culture. I mean, a lot of brands say they're going to build culture. If you don't have culture at the start or if you didn't have culture in the past, you're probably wasting your time. But if you, if you have had it, this is the time to really add to it moving forward. And my last one is just work out how to keep on being real. Keep it simple. Be very clear of what your competitive advantage is. Make it simple for your customer and be real. Really back what your core product proposition is. Keep it real. Don't get too fancy. 
eliminate a lot of the noise. Remember, McDonald's and KFC are the most unloved brands, but the most successful. And very well said uh, on that note, and and some super great advice there, Mark. Uh, and I think there's a lot a lot of meat in this uh, conversation for people to reflect on. Uh, if people want to check you out a bit more, where where can they find you? I'd probably say LinkedIn is the best, um, Michael. I didn't do much of LinkedIn, but uh, since leaving GYG, I, I look at it quite a bit. So uh, definitely reach out to me there if you uh, if you want to have a chat. So, Mark, thank you so much for for taking your your valuable time out and uh, I sending you all the power and energy you need and your family need to 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 get through this. Uh, this has been an absolutely uh, inspiring conversation. Absolute pleasure, man. I hope we see you in person at some point. We will uh, on the other side. On the yeah. other side, come to the northern beaches. It's beautiful in Sydney. We will. <laughs> we will do a podcast there. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. We'll have a good day. Mark, that was absolutely awesome. Thanks for your clear guidelines on the importance of having a clear strategic direction, the right people on the bus, building culture, and the importance for a CEO to connect and visit the front line on an ongoing basis. If you would like to get inspired by a similar story, you should be tuning in to our episode number 10, Leadership Advice from Andreas Carlson, the CEO of Sticks and Sushi. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please give us a like, share, rate, or subscribe to one of our channels. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to the community and download free leadership tools at hospitalitymavericks.com. Thanks for listening and be maverick.